you would open up your Bibles to James, the second chapter, we're going to be looking at a passage there as we get started this morning. Before we get there, though, we're going to open with a passage here in Proverbs chapter 6. And you have to excuse me if I'm sniffling a little bit. I woke up this morning, and as the morning progressed, I realized that I seemed to be coming down with a little something. So bear with me. But in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 12, beginning, we read here or we see this portrait, in a sense, of somebody that we don't want to be. But the proverb writer says, a worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes, he shuffles his feet, he points with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. And so we have an individual described here that is insincere, somebody who clearly is out for his own interest and only concerned with self. The title of our lesson this morning is Prove It. I think that it's safe to say that the majority of I guess it's still safe to say at this point in in history, but the majority of people in this country would classify themselves or define themselves using the term Christian. Well, we can call ourselves a lot of different things. We can describe ourselves a lot of different ways. But... We understand, of course, that just because somebody says something doesn't necessarily make it the truth, does it? And so while we might go around and say, well, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ or I believe in God. That doesn't necessarily mean that those things are true. And so the lesson this morning is to get us to thinking about how God and His Word has called us not just to claim to be followers of His, but rather to prove that we are. And we do that, as we're going to see in the passages that we study together, that we accomplish this by our actions, by the things that we say, the things that we do, the way that we conduct ourselves from day to day. You've probably heard somebody say at one point or another, you know, maybe they've made some mistakes or maybe they're engaged in some things that really aren't correct or not right as we would compare that with the Word of God. But they'll say something like, well, it's okay. You know, God knows my heart. We hear people say that from time to time. Well, again, as we're going to see looking at the Scriptures this morning, I think we're going to see that such a mentality is quite foolish because it really ultimately doesn't matter what our heart is like in the sense of what we know to be right, what we know to be good and just, because if we're not acting on that, if the things that we constantly say and do contradict that, then we're defining ourselves to be something far different than what we claim our heart is all about. Words mean literally nothing if we do not show that we mean them. If you have your Bibles open there to James chapter 2, I'd like us to begin reading in verse 14 and read down through the end of this second chapter. Because here James spends some time talking about the idea of faith alone. And that's a popular idea in the religious world today, the idea of faith only or just believing and leaving it at that and that being sufficient in and of itself for salvation and for God's justification and grace. 
But James points out here that there's more to faith than just, yes, I believe in God. And so starting in verse 14, he asks a question, what does it profit? My brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Okay, well, show me your faith without your works. And I, notice, will show you my faith by my works. It's kind of hard to prove to somebody that you really believe something if you don't follow through with the way that you live, is it? But if we have the works to accompany the faith or the belief, then they go hand in hand. They confirm one another. Verse 19 is especially humbling. He says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. But notice, even the demons believe. And then not only do they believe, but they do something in response to that belief. They tremble. Do you ever catch that? So even the, uh, the demons in their belief in God, their acknowledgement of God, have some kind of works in response to it. Now, of course, it's not the works that God would have them to be engaged in. It's just a, it's a fear, it's a trembling in recognizing that their own conduct is in conflict with the will of God. But nonetheless, they're doing something. What are we doing? That's kind of the point that he's trying to bring out. Verse 20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, when this body dies, what's happening is the spiritual part of us is departing. And so when the body is without the spirit, it's dead. But then the larger point, bringing back to what he's been talking about, faith without works is dead also. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, Jesus spends some time rebuking certain of the Jewish leaders because of their hypocrisy. They would say one thing, they would claim to believe one way, but then their actions would conflict with those claims. And so I'd like to notice a few verses from this chapter, starting in verse 1 here. Jesus speaks to the multitudes and to his disciples, and he says, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And so they're in a a position of authority as such. Verse 3, therefore, because of this, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say, and they do not do. They bind heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves, he says, will not move, uh, move them with one of their fingers. And so they're up here in this position of authority, and it's not that the things that they're teaching are incorrect, but the problem is, if we just look at them and and take them as an example, well, they're not practicing what they're preaching is basically what Jesus is saying here. So Jesus says, well, yeah, they're teaching you the right things. You need to follow what they're saying, but don't follow their example because then you're going to be a hypocrite as they are. A little bit further down there in the chapter, verse 25, 
as he's directly speaking to these individuals. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and he calls them hypocrites. You know, the, the word hypocrite uh, has its roots. Uh, the meaning is, is an actor or somebody who's putting on a show. Somebody's wearing a mask. And so they're not truly who they are or they're, they're putting on a, a front, in other words. They're hiding their true nature. And so that's what he's calling these people. He says, you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, where it really matters, that's where the, the food or the, the content of what you'd be consuming would be contained, right? On the inside. He says, the inside of the cup and dish uh, is, is full of extortion and self-indulgence. He says, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside that the outside may also be clean. Again, verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside, he says, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so we certainly don't want to be amongst those who could be defined in this way. As we think about this idea of proving things, I want us to think about God for just a moment and think about how God has not asked us to do anything that He Himself has not done. God has proven Himself to be true. He has proven His love for us consistently, time and time again, down through the course of time. And of course, ultimately, that was accomplished with the gift of His Son there on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Let's come here to Hebrews chapter 6 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 6 and beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> we read here, When God made a promise to Abraham... <clears throat> Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, that being Abraham, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In other words, you have... Uh, people going back and forth in a conversation or maybe it's some type of an argument even and finally somebody says well I swear I'm telling the truth or I swear on a stack of Bibles or whatever it is and that kind of okay well I guess I believe you now and that's kind of what he's he's talking about here this is kind of the end of the dispute when somebody finally takes an oath or they swear upon something verse 17 thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel or the unchanging nature of it he confirmed it by an oath that by two unchangeable or immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie he might have strong consolation who have fled or we rather might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us and so the two immutable things there would be the promise and the oath and so God didn't just make a promise, He also made an oath to expound upon the fact that He was indeed uh, keeping His word and, and the things that he, were, he was speaking were true. And of course we see the fulfillment of all that as we look down through, as we said a moment ago, the course of history and how all those promises that were made to Abraham have found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3 verse 25 here we read, you are sons of the prophets. This would be the apostle speaking to the Jews. He says, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed all families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. The blessing... That promise that was made to Abraham was a spiritual blessing. 
a deliverance from the consequence of sin, the condemnation of sin through the blood of Christ. 2 Samuel 22, verse 31, it says, As for God, His way is perfect. Notice the word of the Lord is proven. It's not that God has just said all these things and we just hope they're true. No, He's proven His word to be true. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. Notice here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 beginning, we read specifically concerning Christ and what He did. It says, When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But notice God demonstrates he demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And so again, God doesn't just say, yeah, I love you. Just take my word for it. No, he's demonstrated. He's shown it. He's proved it, hasn't he? In sending his son to die. You recall what Jesus said there in John 15 and verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And of course, the somewhat ironic thing about that statement is that Jesus not only did that, but he went even a step further, didn't he? As we just read there in Romans 5, he laid down his life not just for his friends, but even for those that considered him to be an enemy, even those that were walking in opposition to him and to his father's will. And that would include you and I. And so we ask the question, are we all talk? You know, God, the God that we serve is not just talk. He's proven himself. He's established that he is true and faithful. What about us? As we claim to be walking and following in his footsteps, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Here, Solomon, as he wrote, he says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God... Do not delay to pay it. Pardon me. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. You know, in a lot of ways, when we obey the gospel, we are pledging ourselves to God. We're taking a vow in a sense. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to abide in your teaching. Well, how serious do we take that? Are we just speaking hastily? Are we doing these things just for show? Or are we sincere? In James 5 and verse 12, James says, Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no lest you fall into judgment. Now, I can recall as a younger man many times, uh, I'm thinking school age, I would be, you know, you're on the playground or whatever it is and you get in those situations where somebody's, well, I cross my heart and hope to die or, well, you need to swear on a stack of Bibles or you know, we used that example earlier, whatever it is. And I would always say, no, I don't do that. I just... You know, because I'd been taught this verse and how, you know, it's incorrect to, to go beyond just yes or no. And people sometimes would get a little frustrated with me because of that. But when we're consistent in proving ourselves, then it shouldn't be necessary for us to go beyond just yes, I'll do that. Or no, I won't do that. And that's the way it should be. And that's what James is saying here. Back here in 1 Kings 2 verse 1. 
It says, The days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, and We understand, of course, Solomon was to take the throne in his father's stead. And so this is what David speaks and says to him. I go the way of all the earth. He says, be strong, therefore, and prove yourself. Notice that. Prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His judgments, and His testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. You know, sometimes we read verses like that, the idea of, you know, prove yourself a man, and the women are kind of sitting there like, well, it doesn't apply to me. Well, it does apply to you. Um, it's, it's more than just male and female here. It's really the idea of you know, proving yourself to be who God wants you to be. Stepping up and, and not just being all talk, but following through with the things that you say and you do in a consistent fashion. Romans 12, verse 1. We read here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's the goal? That we may prove, see that again? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can we prove it? Well, it, it takes a, a transformation out of uh, being adhered to the things of this life, this world, and being transformed and renewed by the Word of God and, and serving those things and following those things. I think Jesus perhaps said it best, as He often does. In John 14 and verse 15, just a... Such a short little verse, but there's so much there. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I don't think there's anybody here this morning that would not say, yes, I love Jesus Christ. But if we love him, keep his commandments. Prove it, in other words. There's a quote that I, I come to be quite fond of. But the quote is, it's not who you are underneath, it's what you do that defines you. And I think that's very true. You know, we can know the Word of God inside and out. We can know what is right. We can know what is wrong. We can be able to recite it word for word. There's a, an older gentleman at the congregation there in Moundsville, West Virginia, where I worked for a number of years. And everybody really admires him because he can just spout off Scripture like it's nothing. Just He's memorized it and, and gone over it so many times that oftentimes when he gets up to preach, he doesn't even have uh, notes or anything written down because he just, he just remembers it. And it's, it's really quite impressive. But we can be like that all day long, but if our life doesn't match what's in here, then what's, what's a profit? I'd like us to conclude this morning by coming over here to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to consider this scene that is portrayed for us of the end of the world and what will take place when the end comes. And Jesus, of course, is the one who is speaking here. And he says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, and this is where we want to be, he will say, Come, you blessed of my father, 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For, in other words, this is why you're now going to be able to inherit this everlasting kingdom. For, verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So you see how it's all about what they did? You know, Christianity and, and being a Christian is not an academic exercise in well, we need to learn these things and be able to, you know, that's, that's certainly part of it. But it's, it's our life. Remember Paul said there in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. So verse 41, we find that this other group is addressed. The goats on the left hand. He will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for them. It was prepared, prepared for the devil. But he says, nonetheless, you're going to be partakers of it. And notice again, verse 42, for there's a reason. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer to them saying, Assuredly, I say inasmuch as as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so what are you proving with your life? What about this very day? If you're here this morning and you recognize a need to make correction in your life, we have selected a song of invitation that we'll sing here in just a moment. Go ahead and get your songbooks out and open up to that song. But during this time, if you have a need to make a correction, we would love to assist you in that, whether it be to obey the gospel or whether it be to repent and confess and ask for prayers, whatever way that we can be of help to you. And so at this time, if you have that need, please make that known by coming up to the front while we stand together and sing. <laughs>